You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in the nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Friday, the 2nd of February. Abdallah and his new power list of British Bangladeshis. Chief Rabbi weighs into Sunday Times scarf cartoon row. Deceit, treachery and hypocrisy. It was a grubby day's work for the left. 50% of Spanish families with no savings. Minority paying to support majority as employment level plummets in Denmark. Nick Griffin, MEP, from the belly of the beast. High schoolers told cannibalism allowed in Egypt. Iran successfully sends monkey into orbit. Thought for the day. Could a holocaust happen again? And finally, just how low can a newspaper stoop? UK News Abdullah and his new power list of British Bangladeshis. If medals were awarded for networking in Tower Hamlet's politics, Labour's Abdullah would walk away with all the gold on offer in Dubai. A former member of the Metropolitan Police Authority, he was elected to the council in 2006 and immediately became the borough's grand chief of anti-crime, a post he held until Lutfar Rahmin became mayor in 2010. Since then, he's been busying himself with his other great passion, finding a seat in Westminster. Partly to that end, he established the Labour Faith Network, which has the backing of his former tutor, Lord Glassman. In the past couple of years, he's helped publish the British Bangladeshi 100. This list of a hundred influential business people, politicians, celebrities and others in a celebration of the influence and success of the Bengali community in Britain. The list, which was unveiled at a reception attended by Theresa May and Chaka Amana last week, makes for fascinating reading. It's not numbered, so it avoids the squabbles of ranking, although it's fair to say that Lutfor has been placed literally above Rushanara Ali for a reason. Chief Rabbi weighs into Sunday Times scarf cartoon row. The Chief Rabbi has warned of the dangers of inflammatory images such as Gerald Scarf's Sunday Times cartoon about Benjamin Netanyahu. Lord Sachs did not go so far as calling Mr Scarf's drawing anti-Semitic. It shows the Israeli leader wielding a weapon over a wall cemented together with the blood of Palestinians. Others have labelled it reminiscent of historic blood libels against the Jews. But the Chief Rabbi has said that regardless of the intention, the danger of publishing this type of cartoon on Holocaust Memorial Day in a respected national newspaper was such that images reinforce a great slander of our times that Jews, victims of the Holocaust, are now perpetrators of a similar crime. Not only is this manifestly untrue, it is also inflammatory and deeply dangerous. Deceit, treachery and hypocrisy. It was a grubby day's work for the left. Liberal and Labour MPs defeated a proposal to trim the Commons by 50 MPs. It would have saved us millions and equalised constituency sizes. The professional politicos of the left hated the thought. Come the result at 4.18pm, Labour women screamed delight. A sharp, triumphant call, it could have been the cry of countless peacocks, victory. Actually, not peacocks, peahens. They had succeeded in protecting their rotten burrows. Ed Miliband was escorted into the chamber to hear the result, heavies clearing a path for their man. Labour people say changing the constituency boundaries would cost them 20 seats, such as the current pro-Labour bias. They are comfortable with that bent state of affairs. A World Date writer comments, French Aristos did not vote for the guillotine and Labour will do anything for a vote, even to the extent of blanketing their own country with foreigners for just that purpose, not the multicultural dream. European news. 50% of Spanish families with no savings. Half of Spanish families were unable to save a single euro in 2012, a 4% rise over the previous year, according to data released on Tuesday by Spanish ratings agency Axor. The 50% figure rises to 72% when taking into account families supported by someone aged 70 plus, which means pensions are barely enough to survive, the data showed. Another 26% of families was able to put up €3,000 into a savings account and 14% were able to save three to €6,000 or €250 to €500 Euros a month. 
Another 11% said they saved more than €6,000 last year, minus 3% over 2011, while 1% of Spanish families stashed more than €25,000 away last year. The Axor data also showed that 50% of families supported by people aged 31 to 40 were able to save, against almost none headed by pensioners. More families with fewer members were able to save, with single-person families at the top of that list. Single earner families got a €13,500 tax cut, which helped single-person families the most. Bank deposits fell to 23% in 2012, from 41% the previous year, the Axor numbers also showed. Minority paying to support majority as employment level plummets. Pressure on council finances is increasing after a study reveals that only three of Denmark's 98 councils have a majority of residents in work. The number of councils with a majority of residents in work has fallen drastically in the past four years, according to a study by municipal policy research group Cora. The Cora study found that only three of Denmark's 98 councils currently have a majority of employed residents. This is a significant reduction from 2009, when 59 councils could boast that a majority of their residents were in work. The out-of-work population includes children and students, but according to Kurt Hulber, Cora's head of research, it is the rising number of senior citizens and unemployed residents that poses the biggest threat. These are the greatest problems facing councils, both in the short and even more pressingly in the long term, Hulberg told DR News, adding that fewer people in work meant less tax income for councils to spend. France, two new arrests over Mera shooting spree. French police have arrested two men in connection with last year's attacks by extremist gunman Mohamed Mera, whose shooting spree in and around the southern city of Toulouse left seven people dead. A source close to the investigation said the two men, aged 28 and 30, were arrested on Tuesday in Toulouse and brought to Paris for questioning. Under French anti-terrorism laws, they can be held up for four days without charge. A judicial source said that the men were acquaintances of Mera and had been placed under surveillance at the weekend. French police are investigating whether Mera had any accomplices in carrying out his attacks last March, with officials saying they doubt he acted alone. A self-described Al-Qaeda sympathiser, Mera shot a rabbi, three Jewish schoolchildren and three French paratroopers before being shot dead in a police siege at Toulouse. In early December, a 38-year-old man and his girlfriend were arrested in connection with the attacks, but both were later released without charge. Mera's brother, Abdul Kader, has been charged as an accomplice and remains in custody. I now hand you over to Nick Griffin, MEP, who talks today on the leftist attack on the Alliance funding and very much more. Well, after getting the silent treatment from the controlled media for many months, we seem to have entered a new phase of the endless cycle. Clearly, the masters of deceit and the sultans of spin have realised that pretending we'd gone away hasn't made us go away. So now they're returning, as dogs do to their own vomit, to their other tactic, whereby smears are supposed to do the job that silence has failed to do. We've had some great coverage of an experimental leaflet put out by our team in Havering, in which we warn about the Labour Party's shocking record of paedophilia. The Bournemouth Echo picked up a Twitter storm in a teacup and ran a straight report that helped push my following up within striking distance of 20,000. By the way, if you're not among my merry and significant Twitter band, I'm the third most popular out of the 72 UK MEPs, then please do take a moment to join and follow me on Twitter. Let's get over 20,000. There's more media coverage to come soon too. As soon as I finish this, for example, I'm off to do a pre-recorded discussion on the Northwest edition of the Blatant Bias Corporation's Sunday Politics for this weekend. But the biggest national coverage this week resulted from the attempt by left-wing MEPs to stop our alliance of European national movements from getting its share of the 20 million euro pot set aside to help fund pan-European political parties. As I told Ian Dale on LBC Radio, I don't actually think that any European level party should get any taxpayers' money. The whole scheme is just another piece of federalism by stealth, because the aim is to make electors choose their representatives from European parties rather than the traditional national ones. Did you ever ask for that? And to add injury to insult, it's all paid for by taxpayers who are constantly being lectured about the necessity for austerity. But since every euro we get comes off the millions that are hoovered up by all the other parties, I regard it as a sort of rebate for our voters to get a little bit of their taxes diverted 
to help support the cause and principles they support, rather than their being forced to fund unrepentant communists, anti-human greens and the right-wing puppets of assorted greedy corporations. I was very pleased that Mr Dale had the honesty and decency to say on air that my account of the plan for Federalist pan-European list MEPs was the first he'd heard about it, and even happier to be able to tell his good-sized audience about the six and a half thousand euros worth of luxury chocolates enjoyed by the EU socialist group, which includes Labour MEPs from Britain, courtesy of the long-suffering taxpayer. If the undemocratic effort to deny the alliance our small share of the funding pot does succeed, it will be a short term organisational blow to our efforts to coordinate the various national resistance efforts to EU austerity and tyranny. But the delighted squeals of hysterical joy from the left and media would only serve to draw public attention to what was previously in effect an elite stealth tax secretly imposed on blissfully ignorant voters. The attack on us has already brought the whole sordid con out into the open, and a victory for the left would be one that, in the end, will cost them and all the other acceptable parties much more in reputation than it would cost us in euros. Imagine the impact on voters of getting big, glossy, expensive election addresses from the establishment parties, and a small black and white one from us that includes the message, we're sorry we can't afford to send you big, glossy leaflets like the other parties, but Unlike them, we don't get millions of your tax money. We pay for our own leaflets. The others put out their flashy propaganda with your money. That's jujitsu politics, and we're good at it. We also had extensive press coverage this week of misquoted snippets from my speech to last weekend's very successful organisers conference. The story, which ran, among others, in The Independent, The Loss Making Guardian, The Metro and The Huffington Post, came from a twisted review of my speech by the former academic expert on the BNP, Matthew Goodwin, who's now abandoned all pretense of objectivity and honesty to become a mouthpiece for a mysteriously well-funded gang of Marxist thugs. As everyone who's heard it knows, my speech included a section on how the increasing injustices and poverty that blight Britain under Cameron's austerity drive are creating a situation in which homelessness and hunger are becoming ever more common out there on the streets of our once prosperous country. I went on to say that this is both an enormous opportunity and a huge challenge for the British National Party. Let's look at this a bit more closely because it's really important. It's an opportunity because the biggest block to our progress is not the power of the old parties, repression by the police, BBC bias or far left smears. Far worse than all those things put together is the sadly well-founded bitter cynicism of millions of ordinary folk who have been so badly let down by Lab Lib Con that their reaction to any political activist, including us, is, politicians, you're all the same, only in it for yourselves. We know we're different. We know we have the answers. We know that the only connection between the corruption, treason and stupidity of the Westminster elite is that they're the cancer, while we're the surgeon with the scalpel. But what we know doesn't mean anything to Jack and Jill public. What we say isn't worth much either, for words are cheap, particularly the words of politicians seeking votes. If we really want to convince people that we're different, if we're serious about building the powerful movement needed to carry through the all-encompassing revolution that's the only thing that can save our nation, then we have to deal in more than words. We have to prove that we are different through our actions. The weary, bitter, put upon public are giving up voting because they're convinced that politicians are all in it for themselves. In some parts of Salford, to give a particularly shocking but by no means unique example, turnout in local elections has collapsed to below 10% and falling. Labour have an unshakable majority among that 10%, but it won't save them for an instant if we can only give even a small proportion of the 90% who don't vote clear evidence that we really are different, that we really are on their side. I repeat, because it's so important, nothing we can write or say or promise will change their minds. A massive increase in the pain they feel, either through a full-blown economic collapse or the boiling over of the ethno-religious melting pot, might well drive some of them back to the polls in desperation, but neither guarantees that, once in the polling booth, they would vote for us. 
The only thing that can undo their hard-earned and thoroughly understandable cynicism, the only thing that can give them back hope in the possibility that someone in politics gets it and won't turn their backs on them the day after the election, the only thing that can make them want to vote for the British National Party is for us to do things that give them and their neighbours direct personal experience of BNP activists going out of our way to help people in their community. This may best be done by, for example, running soup kitchens for the homeless and shaming councils into housing former soldiers who are sleeping rough, or by giving pensioners electricity card top-ups, hot meals or food parcels, or setting up activity programmes for bored kids and helping to curb antisocial behaviour. The discussion on this at our conference revealed that around 10% of our officials have already some experience of such deep community action, but we need a lot more experience which can only come from failed as well as from successful experiments before we come up with the most effective combination of activity. We will see. But as I said at the conference, the opportunity to prove that we really care can only be seized if we can rise to the challenge of raising the money we need to do it. We need to prove we're different, but we must do it without plunging the party back into the financial overreach and crisis, which nearly destroyed us three years ago. Which is why I was talking about door-to-door collection of jumble and bric-a-brac for sale by an eBay officer in every group and branch. That's what I was saying we could do with the cash we'd raise if everyone kept and brought to meetings the bits of copper left over when they've had a radiator moved. We don't need that money for the party centre because we've now been running an operational surplus for well over two years. We need extra sources of income because we want to be able to help people who no one else gives a damn about. We'll happily give our time and our work for free because those people are members of our national family and good families look out for their own. But food parcels and fuel and a bit of rolling tobacco for homeless soldiers and big pans of lamb stew cost money. Perhaps Professor Goodwin is so stuck in his Nottingham University ivory tower and has so little experience of the real world that he truly doesn't understand that. But I think it's more likely that he's just telling deliberate lies. Similarly, in talking about the nutritional value of roadkill, I wasn't recommending it as a source of revenue for the BNP, even though I happily admit to still picking up pheasants that others have bowled over because I think it's a shame to waste them and because I have a penchant for the occasional pheasant breast and black pudding salad. No, I was explaining that the thing literally driving people, untold thousands of our British people, to illness and early death through cancer, heart disease and suicide, is not actually starvation, because at a push, you could always eat a rabbit or three. The real killers are hopelessness, because no one seems to care, and loneliness, because the globalist destruction of the manufacturing base that provided decent wages and pride has combined with consumerism, welfareism, and multiculturalism to destroy our communities. And I was pointing out that we don't have to help everyone all of the time to begin to rebuild that lost spirit of community and to give people back hope. We just have to help a few people, a few times, for word to spread that the British National Party is different, that the British National Party cares, because we are and we do. It's just that we've only just realised that we need to prove it by our deeds. Which is what we're going to do now, which is perhaps why our opponents jumped on and twisted my message. Not just because it was possible for a shameless little liar like Goodwin to do so, but because he and his ilk immediately realised that the penny is just dropped with us and that if we only follow this through, our standing with the public will be transformed and the silly, spotty students and swaggering Muslims they wind up to put out smear leaflets against us in working class wards will be laughed off the streets by local people who know exactly who's on their side. We are. You know it. I know it. So I hope you're going to help me to prove it, because this is the key to unlocking new hope new pride, and a new future. Thank you, Nick. That should set the gum flappers' mouths shut. World news. High schoolers told cannibalism aloud. The university where Obama spoke instructs in this type of violence. Now, this news has disturbing content. The curriculum used to instruct young Egyptian students includes permission for them to use Christians and others as lunch, according to a startling report from Walid and Theobor Shubat, 
on the website for Walid Shubat, a former Muslim Brotherhood member who is now a peace activist. In the future, the Egyptian Islamists will not only be conducting systematic violence, but cannibalism against Christians and moderates, they reported, citing a video interview from a man identified as one Egyptian scholar that is online. The teachings are from the curriculum coming from Al-Azhar University, the most reputable of all Islamic schools, according to the report that includes video from the Ezret Zen channel. The scholar said, listen also to what they teach to kids, it says. We are allowing the eating of the flesh of dead humans under necessary conditions. The Shubats reported also that other incidents in the history of Egypt bear out the use of such depravity. If one thinks that Muslims have evolved into a modern mindset, one must remember what took place in Ramallah, in which two Israeli soldiers were beaten and tortured to death, their bodies thrown down from a window to the sounds of Alu Akbar, and their flesh then chewed by the crowd. Iran successfully sends monkey into orbit. AGI Tehran, January 28th. Iran announced that it has sent a monkey into orbit aboard a spacecraft as a first step towards sending astronauts into space in 2020. The Pishkan Pioneer capsule reached an altitude of 120 kilometers for a suborbital flight and then returned intact to Earth, reported Iranian media, stressing that the monkey has survived. In 2011, a similar Iranian mission failed, but the Islamic Republic kept silent as to why. In the past, it has already tried to send a rat, turtles and worms into orbit. The West is suspicious of Tehran's space program, which, like its nuclear one, could have hidden military purposes. A World Date writer states, I didn't know they'd sent one of their ayatollahs into space. Perhaps they should send all of them and give Iran a chance to evolve from radical Islamism. Thought for the day. Could a Holocaust happen again? Now let me get one thing straight for my listeners. I am a nationalist. I am not necessarily anti-Muslim or pro-Zionist. To those who think my name is Jewish, they are wrong. My maiden name features in pre-Islamic history in and around Egypt as the Mozar tribes, descended from various branches of wandering desert tribes. During the 12th century, they migrated to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and that is where the name of Mozart himself can be rooted. To those websites that give Jewish names under letters of the alphabet, they give any derivative from the Hebrew name Moses. Once again, some of our nationalist pals have not read the Bible or their history. When Moses was taken from the Nile and given to the daughter of the Pharaoh, believed to be Ramses II, he was unnamed. Pharaoh's daughter gave him an Egyptian name of Moses. Aka took Moses, one of their pharaohs, not a Hebrew name of their slaves. Even now, there is a large date factory in Egypt called Moser Fatty Dates, to my eternal shame. Now, whether any of these wanderers converted to Islam or Judaism, I don't much care, as I am of the Christian variety. So what I am about to talk about is relevant because I am not directly involved. Can the Holocaust happen again? Now, to the people who are involved or married to people of the Jewish faith, obviously it is a very touchy subject, made even more so by the continued harping on and money-making business which has surrounded this awful event since the war. The Holocaust, more than any other event in recorded history, has coloured events and the culture of the Western world and, in a sense, denigrated it to a large extent. We must all remember that at the end of the war was the beginning of the media culture and the taking over of public opinion via radio, television and now the web. In a flurry of Holocaust mania, a tremendous business has grown up around it and the poor survivors, of which there were many, so blasting the final solution of the Third Reich into space. In fact, and in truth, the very many wonderful things the Germanic culture gave to Europe have been lost over the events of the 15 lost years in that country. There seem to be many differing views on the Holocaust and who it actually involved. One is, and remember, I'm speaking on a platform here of ambiguity, that of the six million Jews slaughtered, many were not of the Jewish faith, but fellow Germans who disagreed with the Nazi program, and gypsies who also suffered under that regime. It is also voiced by some that many of the incarcerated souls died of disease and starvation, not gassing, and were not all put alive into furnaces. It is also voiced that many of the rich Jewish population got out and left their poorer cousins to their fates. Whatever the truth, we will never know it, because thankfully we didn't go through it, 
and everyone knows that fortune favours the victor and people's memories do get either fuzzier with time or grow even more elaborate. Whatever the awful truth is, it is past, and the Western media have adopted the Holocaust as a mantra, which I am sure even the Jewish people are rather weary of. That of immigration and the multicultural society much vaunted in today's social circles of power and money. Now on Wednesday we covered the old, or rather new, attitude of the German peoples and the difference between the government and public mores in that country, and the same could be applied to the United Kingdom. It was seen the leftist Marxist golden boys had been washing themselves in the waters of the Red Sea, and if they could, they'd be putting small bits of paper into the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, because they see the Holocaust as being the main reason why no one should ever object to being overrun in their own country. That is a simplification of the matter, but it's true. As soon as someone voices an opinion that perhaps the people of a country should have some say in the running of that country, the old mantra goes up, Nazi and racist, immediately tarring that person with a terrible stigma of having sent millions of the chosen people to their deaths, which incidentally cannot be denied. It happened, as the thousands of survivors can testify. The Holocaust did happen. The sad thing is, it could happen again, and it probably will. Already the Muslims have voiced their opinions that Israel should be wiped off the face of the earth. And who's challenged that? No one with any real cojones. A Gavin Barwell, Conservative Member of Parliament for Croydon Central, has issued a report. It is titled, The Holocaust teaches us what educated people are capable of doing in certain circumstances and just how many people will follow orders. Each year on the 27th of January, the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau by the Red Army, we mark Holocaust Memorial Day. It is an opportunity to remember the victims of this and subsequent genocides and to learn the appropriate lessons so that we can try to ensure it doesn't happen again. Such attitudes towards ethnic or religious minorities persist today around the world, including the UK. Don't believe me. There are people who are happy to tell pollsters that non-white British citizens who were born in this country aren't British. And a significant minority of the electorate believes there will be a clash of civilizations between Muslims and native white Britons. If we want to live in a strong, cohesive society, these attitudes must be challenged. There are extremists in every community, but the vast majority of Britain's black and minority are patriotic. Indeed, research suggests they are more optimistic about Britain than those who were born here, and have exactly the same concerns. Jobs, the cost of living, crime, good health care, and good schools for their kids as everyone else. Anyone who has friends from minority communities knows this. Prejudice is the preserve of the ignorant and more and more. Clearly, Mr. Barwell is using the Holocaust as a reason for everyone to indulge in a lovey-dovey culture fest of all ethnicities in one small country, and we should all be bloody grateful, Mantra. He's wrong. One should not use a terrible event like the Holocaust to illustrate man's mere inability to get on with his fellow man, when the circumstances of that awful event are totally different to what we are facing in this country and Europe in this day and age. Our French correspondent has had a word to say on this, and I quote, Yes, let's water down the Holocaust to include everything the PC Brigade now labels genocide, and throw in a pinch of we're all guilty anti-racism. How anyone can try to find parallels between the literally industrialised killings of six million Jews with even such shocking crimes as Darfur, and then throw in remarks about how we must be nice to minorities, that is beyond understanding. Or rather not. Anything is better than actually talking about Jews, and if one has to, then only with a huge portion of Zionism critique thrown in, not to forget mentioning the Palestinians for good measure. The renowned columnist Karen Inglick wrote a column about her recent visit to London titled Bye Bye London. Her experience shows why this post by Mr Barwell is the new normal. It's no longer don't talk about the war, it's don't talk about the Jews. Thanks also to our man in France for this, and also the related news that the Liberal Democrats are considering whether to withdraw the whip from David Ward MP for Bradford East after he seemed to compare the murder of six million Jews to the treatment of Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza in the run-up to Holocaust Memorial Day. 
He made the comparison on his website yesterday, virtually telling us that the Jews, having suffered under the Holocaust, should know better than to treat the Palestinians in an apparently similar manner, which is complete and utter rubbish, of course. He deserves not only to lose the whip, but to have a good whipping. What we have nowadays in this country is a huge problem with immigration and immigrants. We have a double bubble endemic here. The Muslims are powerful, clever, and are in the process of outbreeding not just us indigenous peoples, but earlier immigrants, ably helped by money from the British taxpayer and a large majority of the Eastern Europeans who may be nearer to our ethnicity and culture, but have brought crime and disease into this country on a huge scale. Words fail me with the Somali immigrants, especially those who came here from Holland, where they were not singled out as being special, as with our authorities, especially the Muslim ones, and are living the life of O'Reilly over here. When you look at all the cons about having a continuing amount of immigrants coming into a small country day by day, you can, whether you like it or not, relate to the pre-war Germans, who didn't have a problem anywhere near as similar or as unmanageable as ours. But of course, one must never, ever voice that opinion. Well, I just have. I have nothing against these peoples because of their ethnicities or their religions. I just don't want any more of them in my country, and in fact would like to return a large portion of them to whence they came. If that makes me a monster, then fine, a monster I will be. Or in the words of a very old email, but a very good one, why kill off six million Jews who in the past contributed to European culture and replace them with 30 million violent, greedy, self-absorbed Muslims in Europe. And we think the Third Reich had problems. Look around, my friends. Our problems are on our doorstep, and they've not been here very long. And look at the trouble they have for the most part caused. And you think, in a self-satisfied way, another Holocaust couldn't happen? Watch this space. And finally, even when our own newspapers... What hope for our country when, with a number of paper sales falling, that liberal rag, the independent newspaper, has published an article promoting a Romanian advertising campaign that is insulting to the British people. The campaign claimed that if you are worried about immigration, then you should go and live in Romania, where half the women look like Kate Middleton and the other half look like her sister Pippa. It goes on to say, Bulgarian and Romanian MPs at the European Parliament have also sent a letter to the European Commission President, Jose Manuel Barroso, complaining about the UK's shabby treatment of its newest member states. This presenter says, Go and set up your newspaper in Romania, and I'm sure the organised Roma gangs will be happy to take your money for protection, and at the same time do the tyre treatment, that is, putting a tyre over your head and setting fire to it. Now that is a multicultural dilemma, isn't it? You've been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart, and I and the team at World at Eight and Radio Britain wish you all a very happy and a very safe weekend. <laughs>